DiscerningHearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Dr. Lillis is an associate professor and the academic dean of St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, as well as the academic advisor for the St. Juan Diego House of Priestly Formation for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from his lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He is the author of Hidden Mountain Secret Garden, a Theological Contemplation of Prayer, as well as numerous other books focused on the spiritual life. In this series of Conversations with Dr. Lillis, we focus on Doctor of the Church, St. Teresa of Avila, and her great spiritual masterwork, The Interior Castle. Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We continue now with Part 2 of our conversation on the Sixth Mansion, Chapter 3 of The Interior Castle. She also says, whatever is received, it won't conflict with sacred scripture. Yes. There's, there's a resonance. And so... One of the easiest kinds of locutions to discern are very simple phrases that come right out of the the sacred scriptures. I talked about a grace for the upbuilding of the church or a freely given grace, which is a little bit different than this. And I talked about John Paul II, you know, using the term, be not afraid. Well, that shows up in the scriptures all over the place. You can think about the angel Gabriel speaking to Mary. So his prophetic utterance for the building up the church was well rooted in the scriptures. Well, similar, these are the easier locutions to discern are, are those locutions that speak in the language of the scriptures. Those are easier to discern from the Lord. The evil one can also use words from the scripture. He's not able to produce the peace that the Lord produces when the Lord um, uh, speaks to us in the language of the scriptures. She also will go on to show how the enemy can be very subtle and how he works. You know, the thing is, Anthony, they sincerely believe what they're hearing is from, is from God. And sometimes that just, they may feel it so strongly, but she really goes to show that you have to be careful because as we know, he comes as an angel of light. Right. You have to be really discerning. Uh, the person who receives the locution, there's a way in which the most important thing you can have about the locution is detachment. It sounds paradoxical to say this. The Lord spoke to me. Shouldn't I treasure what the Lord has said to me? Because we're so easily deceived about what the Lord may say to us, the Lord knows the situation, the ambiguity under which we live. And so he is not offended in the least when uh, when he speaks to us, we kind of we kind of meet that with a little incredulity. We, we no, yeah, I'm not so sure that's the Lord. And the reason why the Lord doesn't take offense to that is because He knows the power of His word. The power of His word is such that it will come back again and again and again, and its power and authority can't be denied. And it takes root in the soul that loves Him. And so the key is to love the Lord more than his gifts. If you love the gifts, including locutions, more than the Lord, then you are very easily deceived. But if you love the Lord more than his gifts, Lord, I'm so afraid that I might have misunderstood this. Even if you were speaking to me, I might have misunderstood it because I have a very active imagination and I always like to make things fit into my worldview. And so, Lord, I, I just, I, I, I don't know how to receive this right now. And, and so I, whatever good is it, I hope it produces good fruit, but I'm not going to let this occupy my free spiritual center. I'm not going to let this take up a lot of my, my time and energy. Maybe when I go to spiritual direction, I'll mention to my spiritual director or to my confessor, that I felt the Lord say this in prayer, and what do they think? And let them advise me and submit everything to authority. And But what happens if the Lord's asking you to do something very particular, like to start a prayer group or some other great work or to start writing or to do some work of service in the church? You know, it would seem, he's spoken to you in your heart, it would seem you'd need to respond. Well, 
if you treat it with suspicion first, I'm not so sure this is from the Lord, and you test everything, and this is what the scriptures say to do, test everything, hold on to what is good, and you submit it to authority, you will be able to discern what the Lord is asking of you, and you will be able to respond to it in the most appropriate way. But if you start in, you know, kind of like enchanted by what you think the Lord has said and what, when the Lord actually speaks to you, because we're so wounded by sin and so forth, we can misunderstand him in a thousand different ways. But if we assume the posture of humility and submit things to, to authority and have doubts about ourselves or propensity to be attached to things other than to God himself, even more attached to his gifts than we are to him. If we're kind of wise and we're humble and we put ourselves in that place, then the words of the Lord can bear fruit in our lives. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is where we really have to be careful of swimming in the sea of pride and false humility. This this can be really sticky territory. Because there may be some people who feel they have an intuition or they might have something. I mean, but it's coming out of them. I mean, they might have a a sense of what God wants and thoughts pop in our mind. And this can be very delicate. And I say it with all reverence because I think people really truly believe it's true when they experience it. But boy, if it starts to smell of pride or false humility, uh, you're in trouble, don't you think? I think so. I'm, somebody can disagree with me about this, but, and again, this is a different kind of uh, thing. This is a vision and locution uh, that uh, for the building of the church, you, and we have two that we can compare to each other to illustrate what you're seeing. We have St. Bernadette's experience in Lourdes, and then we have the experience of the of the children in La Salette. Both visions were declared true by the church. So it's not a matter of whether or not the ver- the the vision and the locutions that followed were from the Lord. They were they were they were discerned to be. There was discerned to be good fruit. But in the case of Saint Bernadette, she had a very good spiritual director who taught her the pathway of humility. And she entered into kind of a silent suffering for the church so that the gift that Our Lady gave to the world through her might bear fruit. And so St. Bernadette will die in obscurity in a, a small convent miles and miles and miles away from Lourdes where things had, had taken place. And and trust me, uh, the, to go to northern France when you're when you're from the Pyrenees Mountains and generations of your family have only lived within a few miles of the village that you're from to all of a sudden go all the way to northern France. This was like a total journey, like the journey of Abraham for Bernadette to do that. And she did, and she died in, uh, in obscurity. Why did God do that? I don't know. But her vision is bore extremely good fruit and still does so today. When you compare that to La Salette, which also had a very powerful spiritual message and did bear some good fruit. But if you look at the visionaries themselves and the people who were immediately close to the visionaries, these people and the vision, uh, at least one of the visionaries, wanted to take financial advantage of what Our Lady was trying to give to the world through that message. And it it led to a lot of personal confusion and their own spiritual life was damaged because instead of going in the pathway of extreme humility before what the Lord was going, they were going on the pathway of how can we profit most from what the Lord is doing here, what the Lord is saying, or what Our Lady is saying through these children. And so just like, and I'm using those two things, neither one of those are experiences that Teresa of Avila is directly speaking about here, but it, But this part is true. The soul that chooses the pathway of humility, that presumes that presumes it it must be mistaken, Uh, that asks the question, how can this be since, uh, like our ladies explain, how can this be since I know not man? In other words, the humble disposition. I want to do the Lord's will, but given my life circumstances, how can the Lord possibly accomplish what he wants to with me? That more humble way of going where the soul places itself 
in the Lord's hand and trust what God is going to do rather than plots and schemes about what it is going to do. That's the pathway that Teresa of Avila is pointing out for her readers here. Put your trust in the Lord, the immensity of his mercy, and he is going to bring about what he wants to bring about through the word he spoke to you in the way he wants to bring it about. He, he may not bring about what you think he means the way you think he should on the timetable that you think he should. And if you live like that, you can frustrate what God wants to do through this beautiful message. But if you live completely dependent on him, even if you're utterly mistaken about, and you self-generated this or somebody tried to deceive you, even then, if you choose the pathway of humility and faith and devotion to the Lord, it will always come out all right in the end. Yeah, it, this this entire chapter is just so filled with tools. I don't mean to try to, and I say it in all reference, but she just gives such incredible insight. In chapter 14, she talks about the soul is attached to the importance of these communications being verified. Then she kind of thinks if that's so important, then there's probably a falsehood there. I mean, she has to be willing to just let it go. And, you know, let God do whatever he's going to do with it. Yeah, there's a holy indifference to everything that is not God's will. And so if I need to know whether or not the Lord's going to confirm this, well, maybe the Lord will confirm it. Maybe he doesn't. I can ask him to. Lord, can you, if you want me to do this, can you confirm it for me? And he may not do that, not the way I want him to. The way he confirms it may be entirely different than anything I could ask or imagine for. So it's much better. Our Lady, again, is a perfect model here. She's responded in the simplicity of faith to what she heard the Lord say, said. If she was mistaken, she's going mistaken. If she went to Ayn Karim, where her cousin Elizabeth was, and Elizabeth wasn't pregnant, well, then she'd know that she was self-deceived. She'd walk back to, to a Nazareth and that, you know, but she had responsibility to act on what she knew the Lord wanted her to do in the moment or what she believed it. And so uh, she, he wanted her to do. And so in all simplicity and humility, she did that thing. She didn't try to figure it all out, how it was all going to work. She just simply acted. And then she got her confirmation. The, the Lord come in that beautiful meeting with Elizabeth, it did come. But it was probably not anything that she imagined was going to be the way it was. She was open to being astonished because she didn't try to figure out what the Lord was going to do. She let the Lord show her what he was going to do. We'll return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis in just a moment. Did you know that Discerning Hearts has a free app in which you can find all your favorite Discerning Hearts programming? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more are found on the Discerning Hearts free app. Did you also know that you can stream Discerning Hearts programming on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. And did you know that Discerning Hearts also has the YouTube page? Be sure to check out all these different places where you can find Discerning Hearts. Litany of Humility O Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being despised, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes, 
Deliver me, Jesus, from the fear of being calumniated. Deliver me, Jesus, from the fear of being forgotten. Deliver me, Jesus, from the fear of being ridiculed. Deliver me, Jesus, from the fear of being wronged. Deliver me, Jesus, from the fear of being suspected. Deliver me, Jesus, that others may be loved more than I, that others may be esteemed more than I, that in the opinion of the world others may increase and I may decrease, that others may be chosen and I set aside, that others may be praised and I unnoticed, that others may be preferred to me in everything, that others may become holier than I, provided that I become as holy as I should. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis. Paragraph 18, too, is, is very important because she talks about the, the devil's deceptions and how we may receive something that is of a weighty matter, something very important, or we're called to act upon an act, or especially if they concern a third person. I mean, maybe go mm-hmm. tell a third person what the Lord has told them to tell them on his behalf. Mm-hmm. But she cautions, you have to go to your confessor. You have mm-hmm. to go to a, a director before you act on it. And if he tells you not to do it, then you don't do it. Because that in itself would be a problem. I think that's important today because it, and I'm not in all reverence to the charismatic movement. This is not a smack on the charismatic movement, but there is maybe a propensity by some who feel they've gotten a message. I referred to that earlier in our conversation, told me to tell you this, or the Lord said this, mm. and they didn't check it first. And that that's important. I mean, at least Teresa seems to be highlighting that as a very important thing. Yeah, oh, no, I agree. Although I think the propensity to do that is not only uh, with those who are in the charismatic renewal, but probably just about almost everybody I've ever worked with in the church. It just works a little bit differently. Someone who assumes that the Lord uh, it's the Lord's will uh, always to work in a way that is financially expedient is going to assume that it's the Lord's will that they go tell so and so such and such about something uh, because this is the financially most expedient thing to do. Somebody else who presumes that the Lord always works in accord with their own personal ambition is going to go tell somebody that they believe it's the Lord's will that they won't probably use the word that it's the Lord's will, but they'll have some other clever concoction that makes them feel like they're not being magical about it, but they'll go tell so-and-so to go do something about something else because it aligns with their own personal ambitions. They mistake the word of the Lord for their own personal ambitions or for what's financially expedient or for the business model that they believe the church should operate under. And so we do this in the body of Christ very, very frequently. The thing about the charismatic renewal uh, that probably throws people off just a little bit is because normally it does come out of prayer in a way that maybe some of these other things that people, it's God's will that you do it this way. You got to just do it this way because, you know, but why do I need to do it this way is because this is the business model that we're using and God wants us to use this business model. Mm -hmm. Well, 
somebody who's a little spiritually mature is going to go, boy, I don't know if they spent a lot of time in prayer when they proposed that to me. Whereas uh, somebody's in the charismatic renewal, they will have probably spent a lot of time in prayer. And so then the thing to do when they, they come to you and propose X, Y, and Z, and you, you can ask them, did you submit this to your spiritual director yet? What did they tell you about this? Because I'm, uh, I'm going to take what you've said to me and I'm going to go to my spiritual director and I'm going to talk to them about it. Or if it's something for the building up of the church, I'm going to talk to my bishop or my pastor about what you've proposed, and we're, we'll discern this together to see whether or not it's God's will. And again, this gets back to what I was saying before. If you choose the pathway of humility, and you su simply humbly act on the things that, in a spirit of humility, then submitting this to somebody in spiritual authority isn't going to be a big drama for you. You're just, you're going to be inclined to do it because you'll be inclined to want to know what the Lord's will is. And you'll also be wise to yourself and your propensity to self-generate stuff that you want to have be your, your own way. So that this problem that she's talking about with souls who are in this advanced state, it is true, souls who are in the charismatic renewal can also kind of struggle with this. But it's also true that, that everybody in the church kind of struggles with this. Everybody who takes what they're doing seriously has work for the Lord. No one proceeds thinking that they're self-generating all these great ideas. They, they all want to believe that somehow God is working through the way they see the world and so forth. And that God might be doing something different and more astonishing than, than my own personal plans and projects is confounding. And so very few have the humility to allow the plan of the Lord to confound them and to make them rethink everything that they thought um, the Lord was about. Uh, you know, they had their agenda and they had that they assumed was God's agenda. And all of a sudden they come up against something and usually you come up against it. And when you go to be obedient, when you submit somebody to somebody else out of obedience and you discover God has a different plan and that, and yours is the one that needs to change, not God's. Well, if we can get into that space, then, then the deceptions of the evil one or things that are self-generated by our imagination can't do the harm they might otherwise do in the body of Christ. You know, I, I can't help but think uh, just real quickly of a saint that Teresa was familiar with, if I'm not mistaken, and that's St. Catherine of Siena. And one of the most powerful things I've ever read, and I thought it was such a gift that she revealed this, was in the dialogues. And I'll make it real quick, but it was where Catherine, as you remember, she had this, uh, felt that she had this ability to be able to look at a person and determine what their life, the course of their life, what it would become. And she, in the dialogues, I think it was number eight, I can't remember exactly, but she said that she was thanking the Father for that. Oh, Father, thank you for this wonderful gift because, you know, I can really help a lot of people and, and I'm just, I'm so humbled to have this. And the Father said to her, I didn't give you that gift. And she went, what? I mean, essentially, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> but she went, what? And he said, all I've asked you to do is love, give, and expect nothing. That gift came from the devil. Mm. And she sat back and she thought, oh, my goodness. And it's because it instilled in her a type of pride where she could sit and tell people what was happening. And it wasn't from God. Mm. If a doctor of the church can have that experience, all of us that need for testing and for listening, it, that's why it, it's so incredibly important, isn't it? Yeah, your story illustrates this kind of way that the ways of the Lord confound us and how his thoughts are so high above our thoughts. And our agendas are always too small for him. And and what he asks for us, from us, and in, in his gifts is, is very, very simple. Recently, I watched a beautiful film about Giuseppe Moscati, St. Giuseppe Moscati. And I know very little about his life apart from uh, watching this video by Ignatius Press. But here was somebody who did just what St. Catherine was told to do. He simply loved those that were given to him to love the best he could under the circumstances they were in. He was a medical doctor and he took care of a lot of people, but especially the poor. 
and as he responded to the graces that he needed to respond to in the moment that he needed to respond to, this beautiful work God did in Napoli was able to unfold. I think that's the way the Lord likes to work in our lives. He gives us what we need, when we need it, the way we need it. We submit it to our friends we try and our spiritual directors. We try to discern the best way forward that we possibly can, and we be humble. But, but if uh, Giuseppe Mascotti tried to map out his career when he was in medical school and to where the Lord was going to put him at the end of his career uh, in serving the poor, uh, he would have never gone there. He, uh, he was a man who was open to surprises, open to being astonished and confounded by the Lord's way, and then would submit to what God was doing in the moment. And the best way to receive these locutions are, is kind of with that kind of obedience of, a heart, of heart and humility. The tail end of this particular chapter of The Way of Perfection, she actually gives a uh, Careful, a list of careful considerations. If things fall in this particular line, if you, you contemplate this, then you can begin to become assured. Like in number 20, she said, and you mentioned this before, the clearness of the language. The words that are divine are so distinct, and the hearer remembers them. If there were mm-hmm. a syllable missing, what words were made use of, even though a whole sentence was spoken? It's just, it's that simple. They, they will remember that. Yep. The other thing about when it's a word from the Lord that she highlights in this part, and we haven't talked to, talked about yet, when the Lord speaks, one of the reasons why you remember everything he says, the way he says it with virtually without any real effort is because what he says is more than what the words convey. And so you remember the words because the words are more meaningful than any other words that have ever been spoken to your soul. They contain things that your mind simply can't exhaust. And they fill your life with meaning. They change your judgments about what you're seeing and the way you're acting, the presumptions you make. They humble you. And at the same time, they give you confidence and they reassure you about God's love and his plan and that he has the power to complete what he's going to complete. And all of this comes all at once. The word of the Lord spoken in our heart fills our hearts with rich, rich meaning that purify us and intensify us all at once. That's the power of the word of the Lord in our lives. We'll continue our conversation on the sixth mansion chapter three in our next episode. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. There too, you'll find an audio version of The Interior Castle by St. Teresa of Avila, the masterwork in which this series has been based. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis.